Turn to one and all, we invite you to stand as you're able and worship with us today. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea.
Good morning. Good morning. I invite you to greet your neighbors with signs of Christ's peace as you take your seat this morning. I've got the candles. Good morning again and welcome to worship at Grace United Methodist Church. We are glad that you are here. We welcome those who are worshiping with us online as well. And if we've not had a chance to meet, we want to introduce ourselves to you. So I am one of the pastors and my name is Jessica. My name is Drew. I get to be one of the pastors here too. Welcome one and all, especially if it's your first time worshiping with us. We are glad that you were led to Grace and we hope that today is a blessing. Yes, and we want to invite you to connect with us, so please take a moment to fill out a Connect card. You'll find these in the pew right in front of you. Um, if you prefer to fill out an electronic copy, you can scan the QR code that you'll find on the order of worship. Um, but this is something that we do each week so that we can celebrate your presence here with us and we can receive your prayer requests and feedback and questions and all that good stuff. That's right. We are in the midst of a sermon series called Table Talk, uh, kind of celebrating that this is a time of year when we gather around tables. We had a chance to do some of that last night. We had a chili cook-off, uh, which was great fun. Uh, and we're also aware that it's a lot of fun. Also, it can be a little awkward because sometimes you're at a table with somebody that you don't agree with or don't uh, necessarily want to sit at the same table with. Uh, and in this time, we are looking at scriptures that are also kind of a little awkward. Uh, we catch Jesus in kind of a judgmental mood. He keeps on pointing to Judgment Day um, right before the cross. So we're embracing the awkwardness and searching for the good news even in the midst of that. Um, and always reminding ourselves and one another that the Lord's table is one that we are all welcome at. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Give us grace to hear them, read them, mark them, learn them, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast to the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Today, it is a joy to continue worship with the reception of a new member. I'm going to invite Bethany Edmonds to come forward. If you'll come on down as she comes forward, I'll mention that uh, Bethany's been with the church for a few months now um, and has already been a joy for us. She's been active in our youth ministry, our youth choir. She's also been an active volunteer uh, in lots of ministry of the church, and she comes today to join the church. You can stand right there, and then Tanya can join you. That's good. And you can face me. <laughs> Through membership and the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism. Acknowledge what God is doing for us and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. Bethany, since the earliest of times, the vows of Christian baptism and membership have consisted first of the renunciation of all that is evil, and then the profession of faith and loyalty to Christ. And so on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness Reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin. If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. As a member of Christ Universal Church and of this congregation of the United Methodist Church, Will you do all in your power to continue to strengthen its ministries and faithfully participate by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say, I will. Amen. And now I'll invite the congregation to stand as you are able. And these next two questions are for you. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, say, we do. And will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and, includes, and include Bethany now before you in your care? If so, I invite you to join me in reading the words on the screen. With, With God's, God's help, help, we will, we will proclaim, proclaim the, the good, good news and, and live according to the example of Christ. Of Christ. We, we will, will surround, surround this person, person with a community, community of love and forgiveness. forgiveness. 
that that she she may may grow grow in her trust of God and be found faithful in her service to others. We will will pray pray for her that that she may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. Now it is our joy to welcome our new sister in Christ. I commend her to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, and perfect her in love. And now may the grace of God, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you so that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. Would you join me in welcoming Bethany? Congratulations and welcome. Thank you. Welcome to the church officially. You can head back to your seat. Amen. Uh, You may be seated, except the children, I'm going to invite you actually to head on to Pop Out Church. That was your children's moment. And today, Pop Out Church is going to be meeting in a different space. So we want you to go that way to meet up with Miss Anna, uh, because you're going to be making some art as a part of Pop Out Church today. And so the children go to Pop Out Church, and then they'll be brought back before the end of worship. And Bethany's volunteering with Pop Out Church. Thank you very much. Getting right to work. Our worship continues now with the time to fill out our connect cards and otherwise center our hearts for worship. Worship continues now with the reading of scripture. Paul Gurlia is our scripture reader today. As he comes forward, I invite you to stand as you are able so that you can hear and receive the word. Good morning, brothers and sisters. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Listen for the word of the Lord. Jesus said, It is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. 
But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As this for this worthless as for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. See, I told you these readings were a little awkward. They're the kind of readings that we expect to find actually in Advent. I mentioned last week that Advent has come early this year. As one author notes, these scripture passages assigned for these three weeks between All Saints and Advent proper, they all take up what are old school Advent themes. Apocalypse, the eschaton, the day of judgment, the day of the Lord. Advent is the only time in the church year when we really ponder not just Jesus at his birth, but Jesus' second or final arrival to judge the quick and the dead. It can be a feel, feel a bit odd to rush the season in this way and awkward to encounter these texts. But if Christmas decorations can show up in stores in August, I guess we can do a little Advent in November. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, to open our hearts and minds to receive your word, your word written in the scriptures, your word proclaimed in the church, your word made flesh in Jesus Christ. Amen. Every November, there's a few things that I always do. One is I rake leaves for me and the kids to jump in. Another is I queue up my special November playlist of all songs related to gratitude and food. And the third is I watch one of my favorite fall movies, Dead Poet Society. Have you seen it? It's set in a New England prep school in autumn, so it's gorgeous. And when the film opens, there's this mural of past students at this prep school, Welton Preparatory School, which some of the students affectionately call Helton. After we see this mural, the camera pans down to a young man, no older than 10, being dressed by his mother for opening convocation. He's got a small cap on his head, struggling to keep a lid on this boy's youth. As his mother tightens his tie so tight that he winces. Then a single candle is lighted and we overhear strict instructions being whispered, 
you will light the candle of the headmaster, and then the headmaster will light the candle of the boys. The procession begins with the school's four pillars stitched on big banners being carried in. Tradition, honor, discipline, excellence. The headmaster's opening remarks include a litany of last year's statistics. 51 graduates, 75 of which went on to the Ivy Leagues. This accomplishment, he says, is the result of fervent dedication to the principles taught here, to which all the parents applaud. The headmaster then informs the crowd that there is a new English teacher this year, himself a graduate of Helton, Mr. John Keating, played by Robin Williams. A couple scenes later, we are in Keating's class. As he enters the room, the boys all fall silent. They sit up straight. They center their textbooks on their desks. But Keating walks right past them, straight from his office to the back door, whistling the 1812 overture, conjuring the bombs he's about to drop on them to blow their young minds open. He gets to the door, turn around, and says to the class, well, come on. Keating knows well the four pillars of his alma mater, tradition, dis honor, discipline, excellence. But by the end of this outside the box, outside the classroom, unorthodox first lecture, he has declared to his students his own pillars, poetry, beauty, romance, and love. We are food for worms, lads, he says. Believe it or not, every one of us in this room is going to one day stop breathing, turn cold, and die. With that, he invites them to lean in close as he quotes Walt Whitman, gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Then he whispers, carpe, carpe diem, seize the day. I love it. In today's parable, it is not four pillars that get handed down from headmaster to student, nor the light of knowledge. It's money, lots and lots of money. A talent is somewhere between one and five years' wages. So when this master doles out five talents to one slave, two talents to a second, and one talent to a third, he's effectively handed them a bajillion dollars. And then he goes away. Traditionally, this is understood to be a parable about Jesus, that he is like the master who lavishes his servants, his disciples, with grace upon grace. The treasures of God, which are his property, are entrusted to his disciples like priceless pearls cast before swine. And then Jesus goes away, promising to return unannounced to see what has come of his investment. The implication of a final coming judgment, a harvest, a settling of accounts, a day that is coming when the world will be made right, the righteous told, well done, good and faithful servant, and the unrighteous told, hit the road, Jack. The promise is that in the end, God's purpose for creation revealed in Christ will be fulfilled. God is going to get what God wants. And God will be the judge of whether we servants are indeed wanted and allowed to enter eternity. But all this begs the question, what is it that God wants? What is God's purpose that God is going to fulfill? What are the terms of God's judgment? Some have always answered that question with terms like the four pillars at Helton. Tradition, honor, discipline, excellence. But the thing is that when Jesus shows up, he doesn't really seem to embody any of those. He's not very traditional. He eats and heals on the Sabbath. He's not very honorable. He associates with tax collectors, prostitutes, and sinners. He's not very disciplined. He's accused of being a drunkard. And he certainly doesn't meet any existing standards of religious or political excellence. He dies a failure. He dies a religious heretic and a political loser. It's not that tradition, honor, discipline, and excellence are bad. It just appears that what God is up to in Jesus Christ is something altogether different. Jesus is clear. All of this is going somewhere. 
And there is a real expectation of God's judgment in the end. He is coming back to judge the quick and the dead. But what is he judging? In subsequent scenes of the movie, Keating's unorthodox methods never cease to thrill. He has the boys rip out the whole introduction of their textbook. He has them stand on a desk to gain a new perspective. He has them shout poetry on a soccer pitch and sound their barbaric yawp. We learn that Keating was once a member of a secret society on, on campus, the titular Dead Poets Society, which his students resurrect in a hidden cave out in the woods. When they get there, they pass out their contraband of cigarettes, centerfolds, and chocolate chip cookies, and they start each meeting with a quote from Thoreau, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life. In the parable, upon receiving this lavish gift from their master, the first two slaves decide to do just that. They decide to do something with what they've been given. They risk it, they use it, they live with it, and it multiplies. This is not some biblical endorsement of venture capitalism, though, far from it. This is an example of living deliberately, sucking out the marrow of life. But the third slave seems so obsessed with not risking running afoul of his headmaster that he's paralyzed. The third slave is unable to enjoy the gift given to him, even for himself, let alone share it with others, for fear of the strings that he assumes are attached to this gift. So instead, he buries his talent and lives out his days weeping in fear of the Lord's return, gnashing his teeth in anxiety over his master, who he believes is coming to judge him harshly. When the master comes, the first two slaves are honored and welcomed by the master. Well done, good and faithful servant. But when the master reaches this third servant, he hears a weepy confession. I knew you were going to be harsh with me, Lord. I knew you were judgmental to a fault, and so I hid your money. Here, you can have it back. You knew I was harsh, did you? Well, if all you believe there is for you in this life is weeping and gnashing of teeth, then all you'll get is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Come back when you are ready to, what did he call it again? Oh yeah, come back when you are ready to enter the joy of your master. So often when the church ponders the final judgment, we have emphasized the fear of the Lord to a fault. This parable is not a warning intended to incite fear in your heart. It is a promise intended to make you ready for heaven. Because heaven, it appears, heaven is all joy. To enter heaven will be to enter into the joy of our master, the joy that is our master. In this light, we see that what got Jesus killed in the first place is his apparent lack of fear of the Lord, a lack of the tradition, honor, discipline, and ex excellence that we expected to find in a savior. And instead, he was all love, all joy, but we weren't ready for that. But now we know. Now we know if we want to be ready for heaven, we are wise to start growing more accustomed to joy. Can you believe that? It's more than a figure of speech, it's an honest question. Can you believe that? In the end, the collision of Keating's poetry, beauty, romance, and love with the ways of Welton Preparatory School land on Keating's own head. In the wake of a tragedy in their community for which his teaching is blamed, Keating is relieved of his position. But in the movie's final scene, as he is being escorted from his classroom, his students, though not all of them, one by one, stand up on their desks their heads level with the classroom's own light, and they pledge their allegiance to him. Oh, captain, my captain. Because of Keating, 
In a world that is passing away, the perspective and posture of these young men has been forever changed. For them, life is more than wealth and prosperity in the Ivy League. For them, it's carpe diem. Seize the day. For us Christians living not in a movie, but nevertheless in a world that is passing away, our invitation is even bolder than that. For us, it's not just carpe diem, it's carpe deus. Seize the Lord. Seize the joy of your master. Sink your teeth into the joy of the gospel. Make it your business. Do your daily dealings in the grace of God. Thoreau says, suck out the marrow of life. Jesus says, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Carpe Deus. Seize the Lord. Live the kind of life that God lives. Love the things that God loves. Tell stories. Write poetry. Throw parties. Give gifts. Enjoy your forgiveness. Trust it. Believe it. Invest it. Waste it. Because under this head master, the one who tries to bury or preserve their life will lose it. It's the one who wastes this life on the things of God who will gain it. Our master has given us great gifts. And with them, God has given us the authority to bind or to loose. So let it loose. And hear the good news. The Lord has come, and yes, he will return. And in the meantime, the Lord is here. He will be coming back. And when he does, he will come to judge. He intends to welcome you into heaven, but not all of you. Your fear may not come. Your excellence, too, it must be left at the door, along with your sin and all death. What he wants of you, what he wants to see when he returns, what he plans to get out of you in this life and the life to come is joy. So carpe deus, seize the Lord and enter into the joy of your master. Amen. Our worship continues now with the time that we call Living Thanks. It is a chance to give thanks to God for this good news revealed in the scriptures and made flesh in Jesus Christ. It's a time when if you uh, fill out a connect card or have an offering with you, you can place those in the baskets. And if you feel called, you're welcome to come and kneel at the kneeling rail for a time of prayer. Today, I feel like it's an invitation to come and enter the joy of your master. Whether or not you are living in joy right now, Please know that joy is what God has for you. Joy is what God is inviting you into, in spite of what you may be going through otherwise. So together, let us live out our thanks and enter into joy.
trusting in God's grace, our worship continues now with the time of prayer on behalf of the church and the world. Let us pray. Loving God, as we enter a new week filled with time for family and friends and an abundance of food, Help us to remember those for whom love is a stranger and for whom food is scarce. May they find in us an experience of your love and grace. Help us also to remember to pause in the busyness of the week ahead to give thanks and show gratitude to those for whom we are especially grateful our friends, and our families. We give thanks for the opportunities you give us each day to share your gifts and blessings with others. And we recognize that sometimes in the craziness of life, we miss these opportunities. Help us, Lord, to notice these holy moments and to extend your grace in the world so that we may close the gap between the world as it is and the world as you created it to be. An experience of joy of your kingdom. We give thanks for the ways that you bless our lives, the gifts you have given us. Help us to live lives that are full and abundant sharing all that we have be been given so that we may fully share in your joy, seizing each day as the gift that it is, and in doing so, seizing the joy of your gospel. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us our sin. Strengthen us in your goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, Keep us close to you. All this we pray in the name of Jesus, who teaches us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. The Lord is faithful and true, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven, and our love of the gospel and joy in the world is renewed. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this time, I want to invite you to stand for our closing worship song.
We are truly thankful you were able to join us for worship today, especially if it was your first time worshiping with us. We are glad that you were led to grace, and we hope that that's exactly what you found here. We want to make sure you know about some ways to remain engaged with grace in the days ahead, and so here are a few of those. Yeah, first, a quick mission update. Uh, This week is our last call for suitcases. We give thanks for all the suitcases and backpacks that have been dropped off at church that will go to bless our local foster children, and I think we need about eight more, so... Um, Thank you for your generosity. We also are excited to be kicking off our angel tree. Um, I got my my angel tree, uh, what are these called? Tags. Tags. Today, they're out on the tree, and I picked mine up today, and this is just a wonderful way for us to bless some local uh, school children with Christmas gifts. So thank you for participating in that. That's right. We want to make sure you know about uh, next Sunday, November 26th, Uh, It's Friends and Family Sunday here at Grace, so if you've got friends and family in town for Thanksgiving, um, we invite you to invite them and just uh, bring them on with you to church, and we'll be able to um, continue to worship God and welcome friends and family along for the weekend. Uh, And then after Thanksgiving on Giving Tuesday, we want to let you know that if you're doing any charitable giving on Giving Tuesday, uh, Grace is participating in Giving Tuesday, so you can let your friends and family know about that too, uh, and you can look for more information about that in the days ahead. All right, I'm going to share with you guys some information for what's coming up on December 3rd. This is our kickoff of Advent, and it is a full day. Uh, We will have worship that day. We will have a church chat during the engagement hour, as well as all of our engagement classes will be taking place. And then after the 11 o'clock service, there will be a women's soup luncheon. Um, And so we invite you to join Pastor Janet, Pastor Denise, and myself as we lead an Advent program and enjoy soup together. Um, this is for all women in the church, and there is child care available for babies through fifth graders, um, but please RSVP. We need to know uh, if you're coming and if you are bringing your kids. Um, and the RSVP is available online as well as in the weekly email. Then in the afternoon, there will be a Tunes and Treats sensory-friendly concert. So we'll turn the lights down low. We'll have lots of space for folks to get up and move around as we enjoy a Christmas concert together. That'll be at 4 o'clock. And then we invite you to stick around afterwards for some treats. And then at 5, after enjoying some hot chocolate and treats, we will walk outside to a light, decorate, and then light our giant outdoor Advent wreath on that first Sunday of Advent. So it's going to be a a full, fun day of kicking off Advent here at Grace. That's right. Uh, We also want to invite you to engagement hour right now at 10 o'clock. There's lots of different things going on, including the class I'm teaching in the fellowship hall. Uh, And so enjoy enjoy the day and stick around. Um, And before I offer the final benediction, um, we want to invite you to help us embody today's parable. Uh, In today's parable, the people were given a gift and expected to do something with it. And so we have a gift for each of you. We've got $25 gift cards, one for every household. And this is coming from our Caring and Sharing Fund, the purpose of which is to extend our communion table out into the community. So for every household, we've got a $25 gift card, and the only expectation is that you do something with it. Uh, Whether that means that this helps you have a great Thanksgiving for your friends and family, or whether you use this to help bless somebody else. Uh, The expectation is that you do something with it that will help spread joy. Uh, So these are your gifts that we're asking your help to share in um, your household and throughout the community. So um, come to the line and get your gift and do something with it. Now receive this final benediction. Go from this place trusting in the grace of God and do something with it. Believe it. Enjoy it. Invest it. Waste it on the things of God, trusting that in the end, it's all joy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.